One of the many important decisions that are facing brand new parents, and oftentimes one of the most perplexing decisions, is what shall we name our baby? You know, most new parents spend hours, if not days, debating this, this question, and we all realize that names matter. Should the new baby be named after his father or his uncle or a favorite friend? Should it, name, should it be given a name that happens to be popular at the moment or one that simply sounds good? Now, Jamie and I have been through this process three different times. Naming our first child was not difficult at all because before we even got married, we talked about the fact that I wanted to have three daughters and I had names picked out for each one of the three and the first one was going to be named Jennifer Elizabeth. And so on that September night when Jennifer was born, that's exactly what we named her. However, Jamie hated the aims of the other two that I'd picked out so much that she made sure the next child was a boy. And she named him Jonathan Michael. Now, we went through an excruciating process when our third child came along. When she finally accepted the fact that she was pregnant, she was convinced it was a girl, and she picked out her, her, her perfect girl's name. Well, I kept asking the obvious question. What if it's a boy? And every time I asked that question, I got the same answer. It will be a girl. So on that Sunday night in Atlanta, in February, when our son was born... <laughs> Jamie had no boy's name picked out. And as after three days, the nurse finally came in and said, you've got to give this baby a name before we can send you home. Well, it happened to be that as I was sitting in the room, I was reading the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the sports page. And so as, as I read every name that we, I came across, I just called it out loud. And after a while, I finally said, Christopher. And she said, yeah, I like that. So I kept reading, and then we, I read about a man named Brian. And she said, yeah, that works. So that's we have Christopher Brian. I am just so thankful, though, she found two names she liked before I got to all the basketball scores. But the truth of the matter is, names are important. Uh, once you pick out a name, that child is stuck with it. You know, for, and it, we know that babies have absolutely no choice in, in the selection of their names. They just have to live with them. They either have to live them up or they have to live them down. But names are important because you tend to become what your name represents. Now every so often you'll come across people that have got multiple names such as Charles Philip Arthur George Windsor. That sounds odd, but we all know him as Prince Charles. You know, it's a, you say that name like that, George uh, Charles Philip Arthur George Windsor is a tough name to land to, 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 to land on a child. Well, he's royalty, so he can handle it. But, you know, it's, it's, it went through the same thing with Jesus. Even before his birth, he was a child with many names. The prophet Isaiah, writing 700 years before the birth of Christ, prophesied that the Messiah would have four names. If you're not already there, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and read with me. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This verse reveals four names that we have for Jesus, and each one unlocks a different aspect of his character. They teach us who he is, and they also teach us how he can help us today. One of, we just sang one of the most beloved carols, What Child Is This? And it started off with a plaintive question, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? 
if that's mother this morning, you have that question in mind. What child is this? Listen to Isaiah's divinely inspired answer. Because through Isaiah, these four names speak to us about the wisdom, the power, the love, and peace of God. Look at the first name. Wonderful Counselor. Literally, this means a wonder of a counselor. It speaks of the, of the wisdom of his plan. The word wonderful is often translated as astonishing or extraordinary. And the writers of the Old Testament use this word wonderful to describe the acts of God which man cannot understand. The word counselor means advisor or ideal ruler. So as we know Jesus as the wonderful counselor, we know two things. First of all, we know that he is the ultimate counselor. Those who come to him will never be led astray. People like in our lifetime, we've had advice givers, Joyce Brothers, uh, Dear Abby, Ann Landers, Dr. Field, many, many, many more. You know, they all made their living giving advice to, to others. But they cannot claim perfection. Uh, it's been said that psychiatrists and advice givers routinely make, routinely make about $150 an hour. Some of them as much as $350 an hour for their counsel. Much of it is good. Some of it's not so good. But the Lord goes to no one to get advice. And when anyone comes to Him, He will give them the counsel that they need and it will always be perfect. Jesus is our ultimate counselor. But not only is He the ultimate counselor, He's also the perfect teacher. This gives us an insight into His workings. Look, we know that His plans are not our plans. We know that His ways are not our ways. He will accomplish things far beyond human comprehension and he will do it in ways we simply just cannot fathom he will do the greatest work ever accomplished and he will always do it successfully a violent death would not be man's way to victory but it was God's plan and our Lord carried it out perfectly so let me apply it this way as the wonderful counselor, Jesus gives to all, he gives wholesome direction to all of his people. Those who follow him will not walk in darkness, but will walk in the blazing light of day. So in this tiny baby that we see all of the wisdom of God wrapped in swaddling clothes. Who is this child? He is the wonderful counselor. But Isaiah also gives him a second name, the mighty God. This speaks of the power of accomplishment. It is, first of all, this is a statement of deity. The baby born in the manger was not just the son of God. He is also God the son. All the fullness of God dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. As the ancient creeds declare, he is the very God of very God. This can't be said about any other human that's ever been born onto this earth. Uh, now there's something else that's important in this title. The, the word translated as mighty, the Hebrew word that's translated as mighty, means strong one or the powerful valiant warrior. Thus the term mighty God is actually a military title. He is the God who fights for his people. At the incarnation, God himself took on the form of human flesh. That's why one of his names is Emmanuel, God with us. Now let's take these first two names, Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, and put them together and see what you got. As the Wonderful Counselor, he makes the plans work. But as Mighty God, he makes the plans work. So one, he makes the plans himself. Secondly, as God, he makes it all work. All of his wonderful plans will be carried out with all of God's infinite might. There is in this little baby all the strength of deity. The power of God are in those tiny fists. He has strength which is divine. The omnipotence of God is at his command. Whatever he desires, he is able to achieve. I put it this way. When we meet Jesus, 
We meet God. He is not just the mighty God. If, if He is not the mighty God, then we are deceived. And it's blasphemy to, for us to be here to worship Him. There is, there's no middle ground. Quite simply, if He is not God, we are fools to worship Him. But if He is God, we are fools not to worship Him. You remember the late, great astronomer Carl Sagan? He, 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 I remember him the best for his PBS series of, on, uh, on television called Cosmos. And in that series, he, he literally evangelized his evolutionary views, especially the notion that the universe is billions and billions and billions of years old. He repeatedly said he didn't believe in the afterlife. Once you died here on this earth, it was over. But he also said he was not an atheist because he said he didn't know enough to rule out the possibility of a God. Well, I can tell you Carl Sagan is, a, is, an, is an evolutionist no more. At this moment, he is neither an atheist nor is he an agnostic because when he has already died, he has already come face to face. He has met the mighty God whom he refused to worship in this life. So in that light, let me repeat what I just said. If Jesus is not God, then we are fools to worship Him. But if He is God, we are fools not to worship Him. Despite all of His great learning and His advanced intellect and His noble achievements, Carl Sagan died a fool's death because he refused to bow the knee before the babe of Bethlehem. If Jesus is just a man, then everything we do at Christmas is in vain. At this point, it's important that we not give in to the sentimental nonsense that makes Christmas a sort of feel-good ecumenical holiday. No wonder everybody is working hard as they can to, to expunge Christmas out of the public square. I refuse to go to the store and let somebody tell me, Happy Holidays! No, it's absolutely Merry Christmas because it's all about the birth of Jesus Christ. But though so many people are working so hard to get the mention of Jesus Christ out of everything in our life, out of the school systems, out of our public life, out of the square. They say it's okay if you want to talk about Jesus at church, but don't talk about him anywhere else. Jesus is the Lord God. Now, while they understand that the, all of Christmas is based on the belief that at Bethlehem that God the Incarnate was born, they try to do everything they can to discount it. They try to do everything they can to say, we know better. We, it can't be that simple. If it's not true that Jesus is the incarnate God who took on the form of, hu of humanity in the manger at Bethlehem, then we are not only wasting our time, then we, we're totally deluded. And of all of the people in this world, we are the ones who deserve to be pitied the most. But the truth of the matter is, He is God. And anyone who refuses to worship Him is nothing but a fool. If, since Jesus is the mighty God, when we rely on Him, we're relying on God Himself. He is the mighty God because we need divine help to help us in all of our battles and struggles. Satan and sin are doing everything they can to defeat us every day. But He is the mighty God. And Jesus has already defeated Satan. So, in this tiny baby, we see the power of God sleeping on Mary's lap. Who is this child? He is the mighty God. But Isaiah gives him a third name. He is the everlasting Father. And in Hebrew, this, father, this phrase literally means the Father of eternity. This speaks of the purpose of His coming. Therefore, he, he, he is before, He is above, and He is beyond time. He is the possessor of eternity. He's, he is essentially like a, like a father to all of His children. Now, this is not a statement about the Trinity, but about the character of our Lord. All that a good father is, Jesus is, 
is to His people because He is the everlasting Father. He loves His children forever. Because He owns eternity, He can give us eternal life. Now that's very important for all of us who live in this sin-cursed planet. No one lives forever. Sooner or later, we're all going to find our place in the graveyard. We're not immortal. We are transistory. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. But not so with Christ. A dead Christ will do us no good. Dying men and women need an undying Savior. So Jesus, like the everlasting Father He is, loves His children forever. And He's also a Father forever. Now this is important to me. And many of you are in the same boat I'm in. I have a Father but not a father forever. I have a father, but he's gone from this world today. He was a very good man. He was a great man. But he wasn't a father forever. Uh, I'm a father to Jennifer and Jonathan and Christopher. But I'm not a father forever. Someday I will pass away. All of us human fathers go, have to go away. But Jesus is a father forever. He is the same today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow. He is a father forever. He is exactly what we need. Now, as a, as a sinful, evil human... Whenever my children need anything, I run to help them. Even though they're adults now and they live on their own, if they cry, I go. If they want me, I'll go to them. I'll never kick them out. They belong to me. They're my children. They bear my name. But what I am, in a poor way to them, Jesus is in a perfect way to all who believe in Him. He is the everlasting Father. So in this tiny baby, we see the love of God sleeping in a stable. Who is this child? He is the everlasting Father. Isaiah gives us a fourth name. In verse 6, he is the Prince of Peace. This phrase literally means the Prince whose coming brings peace. This speaks to the effect of his coming. This, this final title is the climax of all that has gone on before. The word prince means something like general of the army. It speaks of his high position. The word peace speaks of his basic nature. You know, recently I read somewhere where there are more wars going on, the face, going on right now on the face of this planet than at any time in the last century. All over the globe, there are ethnic conflicts and tribal wars. Closer to home, not a day goes by where we, without a word that we read about some senseless killing or multiple killings. Somebody else has been murdered in Chicago or this place or that place. We, we, we see so much killing and we've heard so much of it, it doesn't even surprise us anymore. Very, very little of it even shocks us anymore. And worse, not much of it bothers us anymore. We become immune to violence because we live in a violent world. But Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that God's plan for this world is focused on peace. It's focused on one person, a baby asleep in the manger in Bethlehem. Is, he is the ultimate man of peace. He is, the, he is the Prince of Peace, past, present, and future. In the past, His coming made peace with God. In the present, those who come to Him find peace in their heart. And in the future, His second kingdom will usher in a kingdom of peace. There is no peace in the world today. There's so much strife and there's bloodshed. And yet, even though we read about these peace treaties that have been made by all these different Middle East countries with Israel, we know that there's no peace on this earth. But Jesus is not the failure. We are. Peace is a wonderful thing. But it's hard to find on this world. But it is worth working for. It is worth waiting for. 
And God's ultimate plan for peace, though, does not rest on treaties or lessons or progress or material prosperity. It does not rest on in the, in the halls of government, whether in this country or any other country. God's plan for peace is the maker of peace, Jesus Christ. Peace, quite simply, is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of Jesus Christ in our life. One writer put it this way, the methods of Christ are the methods of peace. The men of Christ are men of peace. The kingdom of Christ is a kingdom of peace. And the principles of Christ are principles of peace. To know Him is to know blessings and happiness. To know Him is to know peace. But to live without Him is to be restless, miserable, and in conflict. He is no warrior. He is no greedy conqueror. He is no empire builder. He came to bring peace. He did it. He's doing it now. And he will continue to do it. So in this tiny baby, we see the peace of God. Welcomed by angels, shepherds, and wise men. Who is this child? What child is this? He is the Prince of Peace. So in this one verse, you have four names of Jesus. But what does that mean to us? And how do we put that into effect, into practice every day? Well, it's really quite simple. If you are confused... He is the Wonderful Counselor. If you are weak, He is the Mighty God. If you are scared, He is the Everlasting Father. And if you are conflicted, He is the Prince of Peace. The year was 1809, and a traveler was passing through the countryside of Kentucky. He stopped at a general store, and he just simply asked a question. Anything around here ever happen? The shop owner said, nope. Nothing around here ever happens. There was a baby, boy, a, a baby boy born out at the Lincoln cabin last night, though. They named him Abraham. Just a baby at the Lincoln cabin. Named Abraham. You just never know what might happen. Because a baby boy was born. No doubt, the innkeeper had no idea who he was turning away. Even Mary couldn't fully imagine what it all meant that night. But that baby boy, born in Bethlehem, has become the centerpiece of human history. We even divide time by his coming. B.C., in A.D., before Christ, and in the year of our Lord. So what child is this? He is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. <clears throat> but as important as these names are, the most important part of this verse is at the very beginning of verse 6. Or unto us. Unto us. This gift has been given to us. A gift requires a response. God has given a gift to every one of us. You've got to respond. Look, in just five days, it's going to be Christmas. If you happen to wake up on Christmas morning and you find a package under the tree from me, First of all, you're going to be just as surprised as I am. <laughs> but what are you going to do if I get? If, if, if are you, you, you going to acknowledge that I gave you a gift? <clears throat> are you going to admire it? You might even pick up the phone and call me and thank me for it. 
But are you going to open it? Are you going to... The truth of the matter is, when somebody gives you a gift, it's not yours until you receive it and until you open it. God has put a Christmas gift for you. He has given one to you. He didn't wrap it with ribbon and bows and, and bright paper. He wrapped it with swaddling clothes. He lighted it, laid it in a manger. It is the gift of His Son. It was given just for you. Yes, He came because He loved the entire world. For God so loved the world. But He gave His Son, you. For you. For unto you is given this day. Have you received the gift of Jesus Christ? Still waiting for you. God still gives them to you. Have you reached out? Have you received Him? Have you surrendered to Him? Have you allowed the gift of Christmas to become your gift of eternity? You can never truly enjoy Christmas until you can look in the Father's face, your Father's face, and tell Him you have received His gift. In his carol, <clears throat> O Little Town of Bethlehem, Philip Brooks has a stanza that is absolutely a delight. I think it's the third stanza. It says, How silently, how silently the wondrous gift was given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of His heaven. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. So many years ago, in a stable in Bethlehem, God gave His greatest gift. He lived. He died. He was buried. And He rose from the dead. That's why you cannot celebrate Christmas without celebrating Easter. Because it's not just because the baby was born. But it's because this baby was born for each of us. And He is God. He is Savior. He is Lord. Oh, come, let us adore Him, for He alone is worthy. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift you have given us in the person of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that. this verse written so many thousands of years ago is so true to us today. For unto us is born this day. For unto us the Son is given. For unto me all because of your great love. Father, there's so many living in this world who do not love you, who do not love their neighbors, yet you love us anyway. And you're here for us. And so today we want to worship you. Today we want to come and adore you. Today we want to come and receive you. <coughs> And as we leave from this place, may we live for you forever and ever and ever. You are our everlasting Father. May we be your everlasting child. Father, my prayer is that everyone who is hearing these words will hear your convicting spirit and will accept the gift of Jesus Christ as their very own. And Father, for those who have already done that, and may we live for you. Since Jesus came and died so that we could live forever, may we live for the one who died for us. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. Will you stand together and sing with us?
And as you sing, the altar is open. <coughs> Thank you.